Good morning. As Pastor Glenn said, my name is Bethany Escada, and my husband Daniel and I moved here from Oregon to Florida two years ago, and our first assignment was to find a church. We moved here for work, and uh, we were looking for a church, and can I just say, I am so glad we found City Church. We found City Church right away, and uh, there's a couple of things that I love about our church that I'd like to share with you this morning. Number one, I love the hospitality. As we drove in, there were parking attendants directing us to VIP parking that first Sunday, right? Awesome. Awesome. And then at the at the door, there's greeters and then ushers welcoming us in and showing us to seats and having handouts. And then the excellence of the overall Sunday morning experience with the music and the sound technicians and the light technicians and the PowerPoint and all of the volunteers that put so much work into the excellence of our experience here. And then the children's programs we heard from the children's pastor already this morning. And so I am so thankful for a church that believes in excellence and the hospitality that comes with it. The other thing that I love about our church, yeah, you can give a hand to that. So, yeah, um, and all of the volunteers that make that happen. The other thing I love about our church is the how multi-ethnic and multi-generational our church is. And I just want to say that our church would not be that if you weren't here. And I'm talking to every single one of you. You guys make City Church what it is. And I'm just so grateful that you've made City Church home uh, for me and my family. So thank you for being a part of the body of Christ here at City Church with me. Because um, it wouldn't be what it is without you. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing that I am really excited about is that I've been asked to speak, and I was not expecting this. I do feel very honored, and although I have been involved in campus ministry full-time with college students for several years, um, this is my first time speaking at a church, um, so I am excited and a little nervous uh, to share with you what God has laid on my heart, and I've entitled my message, Take the First Step. And uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit what that means. Um, but if we could pray first for my nerves and that God would speak to us, okay? <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Father God, we are grateful to be in your presence today um, and to, to declare your praises and to hear your word. And we do ask that your words would be spoken and that our ears would be open to hear, uh, to hear what you have to say and that we would say yes to every invitation that you have for us, knowing that you are a good God who loves us and wants good things for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right. Well, to tell you a little bit about myself before we uh, get too farther into, into the message, I'd like to show you a picture of my family. And uh, this is my family, and we went hiking a couple of weeks ago in July. So when I first moved here in August of 2016, I thought it was way too hot to be outside. But apparently, it only takes two years to acclimate because I decided that July was not too hot to go hiking. Um, it was very warm and swampy, and you can see we look a little sweaty, but we had a really good time, and uh, we're enjoying the outdoors in Florida. So uh, this is my daughter, Nora. She's two, and she is full of life and... Um, really not afraid of much, and it's awesome. Uh, Micah is my um, uh, rough-and-tumble five-year-old boy, and he's a lot of fun. And then Vera is my seven-year-old uh, firstborn, take the lead. And, of course, Daniel, my husband, and he has been my partner and my champion for 13 years, and I'm just so grateful for him in my life and the gift that he is to me. So this is my family. And a couple of months ago, I took Vera to a birthday party. Um, someone uh, had invited her from school. And so I wanted to support my daughter as she wanted to celebrate with her friend. I also really enjoy cake. So yeah, that was a motivator for me too. Um, but it was not the reason I went. Obviously, I wanted to love my daughter and uh, to be able to support her as she wanted to celebrate with her friend. So I walk in and we're greeted by the host family and they're very kind and welcoming and they welcome us in into the backyard and my daughter sees her friends and she goes off and plays with them. And I walk um, to the back and I notice that I don't know anyone in the room, right? There's no one that I have ever met. And I start to feel a little uncomfortable and maybe a little awkward. And I'm trying to think, okay, you know, am I gonna introduce myself? Am I gonna um, maybe sit with my phone and catch up on some social media and some email and make this time about me? I'm a mother of three, I don't get a lot of alone time, so maybe this just becomes a little bit of alone time, right? And I'm trying to think, okay, what am I, what am I gonna do? Has anyone ever been there in these like awkward social moments and you're like not really sure what to do? I, Maybe some of you have experienced coming into church or at a youth group and you walk in and your friends aren't there or maybe it's your first time and you look around and you wonder, um, you feel like maybe people are even looking at you, right? And, and you're like, okay, I don't know anyone and what do I do? Um, 
some, some of us may have experienced this in the lunchroom at work or at school, and we walk in, and maybe our friends that we usually sit with aren't there, and, uh, and you're like, okay, well, do I introduce myself to a table full of strangers, or I don't usually eat with them, so is it okay if I sit down, or I don't really want to sit alone. I hated sitting alone in high school so much that I actually ate alone in my car my senior year, like, quite a bit, because I just don't like the awkwardness of sitting alone and feeling like everyone is looking at me. So I don't know if any of you have experienced this awkwardness and discomfort of, um, of being the one in the social setting that doesn't know anyone. But uh, I feel that way because I don't want to take the first step, right? Like if I'm new to church, I want people to come talk to me, and rightly so. And when I'm in the lunchroom, I just want someone to say, hey, come sit with us. You know, I want the invitation. I don't want to be the one that takes that first step because it's risky, like, what if they actually don't want me to sit with them, right? Like, what if, I mean, that can happen. Like, what, what if they say, like, what if I say the wrong thing? And so, um, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but if you have, the good news is that God has something for us in these moments. There's actually something that God wants us to do in these moments of discomfort and awkwardness. And so, we're going to look at a story of Jesus and what Jesus does um, in the discomfort and how he takes the first step in relationship, so um, if you are here with us today and you are not a Christian, you have not made a decision to follow Jesus, we are so honored that you are here with us. Thank you so much for stepping into the room or watching online. It takes a lot of courage to step into places like this and to explore faith, so thank you for being here. And as I speak for the next 30 minutes or so, you get to listen and decide if you um, want Jesus' teaching in life to influence your life in any way. That's your choice, and we're just honored that you're here. If you are a Christian in the room, you've decided to follow Jesus, then like me, we have already made a choice to be like him and to follow him. So our choice is made for us, and now it's a matter of figuring out who is Jesus and how can we be more like him. And that's what we're going to do today. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to John chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 6, and it will be on the screen for you to follow along. Um, before I read, I want to give some context. So Jesus is Jewish, and he is traveling through Samaria, which is um, an area there near Judea. And so he is traveling through Samaria, and um, there is a lot of hostility between Jews and Samaritans. Um, the hostility is both religious and ethnic. Uh, Jews, if you look at historical documents, um, they're pretty offensive. Um, they go so far as to call Samaritans half-breeds, which to us, it's a very offensive term, and rightly so. And uh, the reason for that is because generations ago, the Samaritans were actually Jews who intermarried with Gentiles in the area. And so there is a lot of hostility um, between uh, Jews and Samaritans. And so Jesus is traveling to Samaria, and he sits down at a well. That is our context. And I'm going to read, uh, starting in verse 6. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. This is the word of the Lord. So as we look at this story, um, I already shared a little bit of the context uh, between Jews and Samaritans and the hostility that existed there. Jewish leaders in Jesus' time went so far as to say, if Jesus drank from the cup of this woman, he was considered unclean, unfit um, 
to go before the Lord. And so the fact, not only that Jesus is engaging her because she is Samaritan, but that he would ask to drink from her cup is just crazy what Jesus is doing. Okay, so there's, there's that. Um, the other thing that's really crazy about this interaction is that Jesus is a man. He's a Jewish leader. And the fact that he is speaking to a woman and an unknown woman at that is also um, outside of anything normal for Jewish leader, Jewish men as leaders to do in that time. So he is engaging a Samaritan. He is engaging a woman. And then also she is, um, she is an outcast by her community. So, um, so he, is, he is engaging someone who has been shunned by others in her community. And we know that because she comes to the well at noon. How many of you like to mow your lawn in the heat of the day in July and August? Anybody like to be outside, right? Very few of us in Florida want to do our outside chores in the heat of the day. And it was the same for these women. They would come to the well in the morning when it was cool rather than coming in the heat of the day in the afternoon. But this woman comes in the afternoon because she's avoiding the women she would see in the morning. And so she's outcast by her community. And we, know, we later learn in the story that the reason she is avoiding her community is because she has had five husbands. Now, we don't know um, her, the context of how she came to have five husbands, but what we do know is that she did not initiate five divorces because as a woman, she could not initiate five divorces. So all we know is that for some reason, either her unfaithfulness or other reasons, she has lost five husbands. And the man that she's with now has not married her, making her situation even more, um, more painful, less respectful. Can you feel the pain that she must have, right? She is, she's avoiding the women. She has no community. She is lonely, and she is walking to do her chores, and she says, just leave me alone. Let me survive my day, right? I don't want to talk to anyone. I just need to get my water and go home. And so she's probably walking up to the well. I imagine her. She has to walk a ways to the well. And as she approaches, she notices that there's a man sitting there. She's probably like, oh, great. Okay, I don't want to talk to anyone. Please leave me alone. And then she notices she, he's Jewish, right? Oh, my gosh. I, I really hope nothing happens. I can imagine just her heart sinking the closer she gets and realizes this guy's sitting there. Right? So what she wants is to not talk to anyone, to be left alone. And I think that Jesus knows exactly what she wants. He sees her coming, and he's sitting there, and I think, being that he's God and being that she's coming at noon, he probably knows she wants to be left alone. But is that what Jesus does? Does he give her what she wants? No, right? Jesus gives her what she needs. He sees her. He knows exactly what it is that she needs, and what she needs is the love of God and transformation. And so he engages her in conversation and in relationship so she can experience that. Love is doing what is best for the other person, and that's exactly what Jesus does. He does what she needs. Um, so... Uh, Jesus chooses to take the first step with her because he knows that's what she needs. Um, he's going to build a relationship with her and engage her so that she may experience the love of God. So I find this to be really challenging. Jesus is talking to someone who is in pain. She doesn't want to talk to anyone. She wants to be left alone. Have any of you ever tried to someone who doesn't want to talk to you? Like maybe a toddler or, you know, a family member or, you know, I, I mean, a difficult coworker, like, it's really difficult to talk to someone who does not want to talk to you. And then on top of it, Jesus is crossing all of these trust barriers that are really difficult. Gender, um, uh, ethnic barriers or racial barriers, religious barriers, and social class. And so Jesus is trying to overcome all of these barriers with her. And the woman is cold and unreceptive, right? Let's look at the text again, um, and we can highlight uh, the verse that she is She is not interested in having this conversation. So um, uh, go back one. There we go. No, yes. I had it highlighted. Um, so she's like, how can you ask me for a drink, right? You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. She is incredulous, the guts of this guy, right? How can you ask me for a drink? And then later, are you greater than our father Jacob? Who do you think you are, right? And she cannot believe the nerve of this guy to be talking to her and asking her for a drink. 
And Jesus is not turned off by her, right? She knows that she's throwing up, like he's not oblivious to her walls, right? But he is persistent despite the walls that she throws up and he chooses to love her anyways. And because of his persistence, there is a breakthrough in her life, a spiritual breakthrough. So if we could turn to John chapter four, verse 25. And it should be on the screen. Perfect. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Um, Jumping down to verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Did you catch that? The difference in her life? She came to the well not wanting to talk to anyone, avoiding her community that she was ashamed of. And now the same woman is the one going back and taking the first step with her community. She's the one going back and starting the conversation with them. What happened? Right? What changed for her? She experienced the love of God, and it was a transforming experience as she spoke to Jesus. And so because of that change, she is no longer ashamed and fearful of her community. The same woman who was fearful is now the one going in boldness and courage to invite them to experience Jesus. And she does it because she experienced the love of God, and she doesn't want them to miss out. Come meet the Messiah. This could be the Messiah. She doesn't want them to miss out on the love that she has just experienced. And so she takes the step to invite them in. What I learned from this woman is that when we experience the love of God, we will be people who take the first step to love others. That that is the result of of experiencing God's love. Now, I want to be clear. Um, There's nothing in the text that says that Jesus told her to go. Um, And I, uh, he doesn't need her to go. Like, I believe that that's the reality. Jesus doesn't tell her because he doesn't need her to go to the community. He could very easily just walk into town. He could be the one to go and initiate with them, but he doesn't do that. And I believe that the reason that Jesus allows the woman to leave her jar and to go back is because the transformation occurs both in her experience with Jesus as he sits with her at the well, and her, she is continually transformed and healed as she goes. It is as she steps out and takes the risk to communicate with the people who once rejected her that she overcomes the fear and the shame that she once had. And she has this incredible experience of witnessing firsthand how her testimony has influenced and transformed her community. We read later in the scripture that many believe in Jesus because of the testimony of this woman and their personal experience with him. And she gets to sit front row and watch that happen. And it's a beautiful thing. You see, as we step out and love people, as Jesus does, we are transformed in the process. And that's what God wants for each one of us. Jesus doesn't need us to go tell people about him. He wants us to be transformed as we choose to be people who take the first step in love. You and I were created in the image of God, the image of one who loves, and we can only reflect that image as we choose to love others. And so it is for our transformation that God asks us to go and to take that first step. Yeah. So what does that first step look like? Going back to the story of the birthday party, um, I I could have sat down and entertained myself with my phone. Uh, But instead, I chose to go. I looked around the room. Okay, who's sitting by themselves? And I chose to start a conversation and to initiate a relationship. And the idea was uh, to listen to what they had to say and what was on their minds and their hearts and to serve them in that moment. And I believe that if Jesus had been at that birthday party, that's what he would have done. He would have initiated a relationship and initiated a conversation for the sake of the other person. And I believe that that's what God wants for us as well. Now, doing this didn't take extra time on my part, right? I'm a working mom. I don't have a lot of extra time. But doing this did not take extra time. It took a change in attitude and an understanding that wherever I go and whatever I'm doing, that God is inviting me to love the person in front of me rather than be about me. So uh, to tell you a little bit more, I, I... uh, reference that I moved here two years ago from Oregon. So uh, we, we transplanted, my husband got a job here, and we moved here, and we didn't know anyone really in Florida. My brother and his wife lived in Orlando, and I had a 
a staff acquaintance um, from my previous job that I knew in Oviedo. And other than that, we were kind of in the middle of nowhere, it felt like to us. We just didn't know anyone. We had no community. And it would have been really easy to become lonely and isolated in those circumstances. And if you've ever been transplanted, you know. You're like, yeah, it's hard, right? Like that, those times can feel really lonely. And so I knew that that, was, that, that, that could happen, but I, I also knew that was not what God wanted for me and my family. And so... Um, I chose to move it. We move, moved into Celery Key, and I chose to take the first step with my neighbors. So some of my neighbors came and introduced themselves to us, which was awesome, and we appreciated that. And um, But we wanted to meet all of our neighbors. And so after we got settled moving in and stuff, we made some cookies, we bought some cookies, and we made plates of treats. And we went door to door and introduced ourselves to the people we hadn't met yet. And so um, I take, you know, I got my plate of cookies and I got my kids and we're marching down the street and we knock door to door and um, we didn't want to just leave the cookies on the ground for the ants or raccoons to find. So we actually kept going like, you know, week after week and, and day after day until we found the people that we were looking to meet. And we just knocked on the door and said, hey, you know, we live here. We wanted to meet our neighbors. What are your names? And then, um, if there's a, put the map on the screen, and then I took a Google Maps, and I just took a screenshot on my computer, and I printed it out, and then I wrote people's names on the houses so that I don't forget. How many of you have ever introduced yourself to someone, and then a week or a month later, you don't remember? And it's so awkward, because then you have to introduce yourself again, right? It's like, oh my gosh, you know, how many times do you want to do that with your neighbors? And so this sits on my refrigerator next to my sink, and I see people's names, and I can pray for them. And, but loving my neighbors has to be more than taking them a plate of cookies once, or even once a year, right? Like this can't just be a Christmas tradition. If I'm gonna love the people around me, I have to be willing to be available for a relationship. So if someone's out walking their dog or cutting their grass, like I wanna come over and talk. I can't do that every time, right? But, but when I can, I wanna be outside and I wanna start a conversation. I'm inviting people into my home for dinner or asking them if they want to go out for a meal or asking them if they want to go for a walk. Any door that is open to me, I want to build a relationship. I believe that God has placed me and my family in Celery Key for a purpose. And the people who live around me, God has placed there for a purpose. And I want to be a good steward of that. Okay, so many of you in this room cannot imagine yourself being the one to walk across the room and start a conversation with a stranger. You're like, that feels so uncomfortable. And I would agree with you, it is uncomfortable. But I must tell you that obedience is not gonna stay in your comfort zone. Okay, I mean, that might feel like a tough word, but it's the truth. Um, Jesus was not comfortable when he talked to this woman. Okay, she was throwing up walls at him, and I am sure he was uncomfortable. And I can tell you he was not comfortable when he went to the cross. And every story in between that we can read about Jesus, Jesus' story is not about one of comfort. And if we're followers of Jesus, then as Christians, our story will not be about our comfort. Taking the first step will feel uncomfortable, but we do it because we have experienced the love of God, and we want others to experience the same Okay, so I've, I've said a lot, and some of you might be with me. Okay, Bethany, I might be uncomfortable, but I, can, I, I know I'm supposed to take the first step, but how do you do it, right? How many of you, maybe you're asking yourself, okay, that's a great idea, but what does this practically look like? How do I do it? So um, I'm so glad you asked. Um, if we had time, we would actually stop and practice right now, but we don't have time. So all of you are breathing a sigh of relief that I'm not gonna make you go talk to a stranger, but you are not off the hook um, because I am still going to challenge you with a homework assignment. So um, uh, I am going to challenge you that when my time is up and the service is dismissed, if you would walk across the room and find a stranger and you can ask them these questions, write them down if you don't know what to ask, or come up with your own questions. These are just questions that I use. There's nothing special about my questions. But um, I, would in I would challenge you if you... I would challenge all of us in the room who call ourselves followers of Jesus to, to take this assignment and to say, I'm gonna take the risk, I'm gonna get uncomfortable, and I'm gonna go talk to someone that I don't know. Because let me tell you, this is the best place to practice this, okay? Everyone has just heard the same assignment and the same message, and it's the family of God, okay? So, so this is a great place um, to get over that awkwardness and the discomfort and to try it and to meet a stranger. Because if God tells you to do it, 
tomorrow with a coworker or someone at school, um, that's, that's going to be a different experience. But you'll at least have practiced here, OK? And experience counts for something. So that, I would encourage you to do that. So several years ago, I was working as a campus minister um, with college students. And it was a little uncomfortable because I was a 30-something pregnant mom. And uh, I don't fit in with 18-year-olds. That was just how it felt. Um, but it was in this context that I met Jessica. And Jessica is the one to your right. And this is our friend Donan. And when I met Jessica as a sophomore, she was not a Christian. And I, like Jesus, decided to take the first step. So I asked her if she wanted to go get coffee or go get lunch, and she said yes, which was great. And I didn't know where the relationship would go. All I knew is that I wanted to love her, and the best way I could love her was to introduce her to the love of God. And the only way for me to do that was to build a relationship with her. So that's where I started. And a couple of months later, I had the opportunity to explain to Jessica what it means to follow Jesus and to ask her if she wanted to do that. And she said no, and that was uncomfortable. And uh, we continued to have a relationship, and I invited her. Um, she was invited by some friends to go to church a couple weeks later, and it was in, at church where someone, again, asked her if she wanted to follow Jesus, and it was at church that she there said yes. Now, I can tell you there were a lot of uncomfortable moments in my relationship with Jessica, but it was so worth it as I got to witness firsthand someone transformed by the love of God. And like this woman, she, like the woman at the well, Jessica also has been transformed by God's love and is now one who goes and takes the first step to love others. And so she's actually working full time um, this fall uh, for the first year, uh, working with college students just like I did in Washington. And she is initiating with students so that they may experience the love of God as she did and she can invite them into a relationship with Jesus. Who are the Jessicas in your life? They might be your noisy neighbors. They might be an obnoxious coworker or a really difficult family member. Um, it might be a stranger you haven't met yet. But I have been praying that God would place someone on your heart, that every single one of, every single one of us in this room, that God would be placing a name in your mind right now. And he would be inviting you to take the first step in relationship with them. If you have experienced God's love for you, if you consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus, then God wants you to take the first step. All right. Next steps. I'm ready for next step. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to take our next steps first. If we're going to do this, we need to experience God's love. So if you're a follower of Jesus in the room, you've already experienced God's love um, in some way, but we need to continually be renewed in God's love for us so that it overflows and we can offer ourselves to others. So it is, I'm going to pray that we would experience that again as we leave, and we've already experienced it in worship, but that we would continue to experience that throughout our week as we're in community and praying and in, our, in, in the word. Secondly, um, we want to ask God who he's leading us to. So as I pray, we'll, we'll take a moment of silence, and hopefully God is placing someone on our hearts. But if you don't have a name in mind, like if God doesn't put a name in your mind, um, that just means that you're to love whoever is in front of you. Finally, um, our last step is to take the first step, right? To actually start a conversation, to invite someone over to your house to eat or to go out to eat, and to just make yourself generally available for a relationship. As we experience God's love, we will be people who demonstrate God's love to others by taking that first step. So I want that for myself. I want that for my church and my family, for my community. I want God's love to so fill my life that, that it just overflows to others, um, that it doesn't feel costly every time I, I feel uncomfortable, right? I just want the love of God to move me as it moved this woman to her community. Can I pray that for us, that we would be people who are moved by the love of God to go to others and to take the risk? All right, let's pray. God, we thank you that from the beginning of creation, you have been the one leading and taking the first step with us. That you ask nothing of us that you have not already done yourself through Jesus Christ. And that it is your great love for us that sent Jesus to earth to die on the cross and to, to raise again. 
God, we want to be reminded of your great love for us, that there is nothing we could do for you to love us more. There is nothing we could do for you to love us less because you are already perfect in your love for us. You are the one that defines what love is. So we thank you for your love for us and we pray that we would be filled once more with that love. I pray also all across this room that you would be placing the name or a face of someone in our lives that you want us to initiate with. There is a need that you know that they have and that you are inviting us to be the one to meet by initiating the conversation, initiating the relationship. God, I pray that we would be people who say yes Um, because we know that you are good, that you want to transform us into your likeness in this process. So no matter how risky or crazy um, the, the name of the person, the assignment that you've given us, that we would say yes, because we know that we will see miracles and we know that you are at work and you are leading We thank you for the opportunity um, to follow you, to be your sons and daughters. And we ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.